Hi, this is MXUX. Uh, this is a video about AppQX. Uh, this is a video about AppTerra. Will they run out of cash? The first time they tried to uh, go into manufacturing, this is what happened. I'm going to do a break-even analysis on their manufacturing costs, back of the napkin, and I got some pictures of the camper I haven't seen before. So let's move on to the first slide. Oh, uh, there is a link in the description for a discount of 30% on the uh, the payment for the pre-order. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you use it. Also, let me just tell you, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to go over the Viper manufacturing because that's what Sandy Monroe is going to use uh, to build the Aptera line. Then we're going to go over the Aptera manufacturing. Then we're going to go over the capacity to see if they can produce enough units. Then we're going to go over the financials and see if they got enough money to do it. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Let's get started. This is Sandy Monroe. He just did a big hour long or half hour long thing with the founders of Aptera. And very interesting. I suggest you watch it. Monroe Live <clears throat> basically says we're going to use the Dodge Viper manufacturing line as the prototype for the Aptera line. Uh, Two main things there is a variable break even point, which means they can expand the capacity without really changing the building. And uh, so it's very flexible. And they have a dancing machine concept, which is a movable work platform that's ergonomic and moves up and down for the uh, workers. I have video on this. Uh, we're going to go over it real quickly here, but let's just hear what Sandy has to say. Extensively with uh, Chrysler uh, before they became other companies on the uh, on the Viper line, and so we're going to apply all those same techniques. And that was a variable break-even point. So you could either build a whole car in with uh, you know eight guys, or if your volume went up. You added more people, and then we had the dancing machine concept. So all you needed was an air pump, and uh, you you click it together, and away you go. You you uh, you move the machines to suit the new position, so that you've got the right number of people. In. Okay, so basically, uh, Sandy Monroe's in charge of setting up the manufacturing, which is good. He's the expert, Deming expert. He's going to model it on the Viper Dodge Viper line, which he also put together. With okay, let's just move on. Sorry about that. So this is a some video of the Viper manufacturing line. And this, just watch it real quickly. You can see no robots. The only robots check uh, do, what all they do is check measurements to make sure it's in spec. Everything's done by hand. Let's just watch the video here. That construction work is behind the scenes here. Anyway, as you can see, this no robots in sight. <clears throat> All hand work. I don't know what version. There was a number of versions of the uh, of the uh, Viper done. Uh, but there you go. These guys are carrying, hand carrying body panels, which you know you wouldn't see in a GM plant, most likely. Not in that. Not in that way. And um, here you go again, hand building. No, no robots here. And, you know, just. And this is this is at the end of the line. This is actually a rolling assembly line. But you can see they have assist machines here that'll uh, help them lift and so forth. But um, just a very straightforward manufacturing line not heavily automated um, let's just go on here now this is this is some more video of the uh, viper manufacturing line this is to demonstrate the if you'll notice there's a bellows under the car frame here that's the dancing air thing monroe was talking about it allows them to adjust the work position and so forth, and you can also see the variable uh, production here, where they have looks like they're only doing one or two cars, but then you look down the line, and there's there's a couple hundred. So demonstrates those two techniques. 
All right. And uh, there now you see below there that, uh, see how that dropped down, that bellows there? That's how that works. And then you can see how many of those they have in the line there. They So this is infinitely expandable. You just add more little cards and there you go. You have more cards. And there again is the bellows. There's computer tracking of all the manufacturing parts and everything. So that's a couple ideas of um, just to get you an idea here. And uh, now in this next clip, let me just go past this. This is they also had to build the engines at the Viper plant. So it made it, you know, quite a bit more complicated uh, than um, what the um, Aptera is going to be. Now, if you pay attention here, there's some robots. The first robots you see on this line, they're checking to make sure everything's in spec. All they're doing is checking micro uh, millimeter measurements uh, to make sure everything's in spec. Deming, statistical quality control. There you go. There's the robots. Just checking measurements. And again, this is a very simple, as you can see, not highly automated at all. Again, with the hand work. And um, so this is what uh, Monroe's been envisioning, envisioning for the Aptera. And uh, so that gives you an idea of the, the Viper workflow. Again, very simple manufacturing plant <clears throat> relatively simple nothing simple but now this is now that was the plant now let's go over the production because you know are they going to be able to scale this are they going to are they going to be able to make enough cars to make any money and here's the thing they basically did you know one to two thousand uh, builds a year um, the highest year was uh, 1.7. I think the average is 1.5. But let me see if I can make this work here. As you can see, these numbers, they are not very high. This is the total production for the year. Okay. Then, so this is some somewhat of a concern here. This is the total production for the entire run. They only made 30,000 cars. So this was kind of a bespoke manufacturing routine. So the question is, you know, are they gonna be able to scale this, uh, you know, to meet demand? And is it gonna be a workable model for the Aptera, uh, the Viper manufacturing technique and the Viper manufacturing line? So let's go to the next slide here. Now we're gonna go into the Aptera manufacturing uh, the, the way they do it or have done it in the past. And this is the first Aptera. Uh, this is the first factory. This is some old video. Um, but it's the same basic concept to give you an idea of how things uh, go together. So let's just. Uh, we use a unique process of trailer composite material called resin infusion. Everything's laid in the mold dry. Put it under thousands of pounds of vacuum pressure, then we inject resin into one side of the part and pull it all the way to the other. This is a completed part right here, and this is actually a bare mold before we lay in the dry material, bag it, and inject the resin. The That's the first step, Terry. We have to bond them all together. We mm -hmm. take the bottom piece and the top piece, tie them together, put it in this alignment jig, bond it, take it out of the jig, and then it goes over to assembly to get rigged with all the running components. Let's take it to the metal shop. It's an interesting tool for us because it allows us to test things like roof press strength, side impact door strength, and many other metrics that we determine to make sure you're out there safe. Now that we're taking a look at the composite shop, the metal fab shop, we should probably really go take a look at what makes this vehicle fit. We'll let time. Okay, that's a real good idea of how the now that's how they were doing it. They have new materials now, new material science, but I think it's going to be basically the same but with uh, new techniques and new materials. And that gives you an idea of how that body goes together if you're curious. So um, uh, they do the mold and then they glue it all together. Uh, this 
if I can, uh, I'm going to click the title here in a minute. This is the original body. And what they're doing is they're doing some, I think, prototype testing here. They're throwing this thing around with a forklift in the plant there to see how sturdy it is. And I want you to watch this and you can get an idea of what a good design this is. And this is the first design, uh, not the one we have now. And there are no doors on it, which provide a lot of strength. And there is no front cone on this, which gives you the whole crush zone. So just keep that in mind. So this is the, there you go. I think, now that's about a six foot drop there. And nothing cracked. I think they got some on the seam there, the paint cracked a little bit. But as you can see, that held up. It didn't fall apart. Uh, the the occupant cavity is cap um, capsule is protected. So that's uh, I think that's that's pretty good. Now um, watch this. They have a forklift behind it, and uh, they're going to do a, a simulate a rear end collision here. Okay, now that's with a forklift. I've driven a forklift. That's the equivalent of a very big truck, I would say. I want to say a bus, but I don't know. Maybe that's going too far. But again, the passenger compartment, you know, without the doors and without the nose cone stayed intact. So I think even this first design with these original materials was a really good design. And this is all pre-iPhone video, so pretty old stuff. Uh, this is another one. We're going to do a front-end collision here. And keep in mind, again, that the doors are not on here. And it's the original materials, not the new advanced materials. And there's no nose cone, which is, is the crush zone. So There you go. Now watch this. They're going to hit it from the front. And again, now that was quite an impact. Again, without the doors. If the doors were in there, I don't think that would have split like that. But look at that. That, that passenger compartment is intact. And that's without the front crush up. So I think that this is a very, very good design. And with the new materials, I think this is this is from 2008 or probably 2005, 2006. You know, just thinks how, how things have advanced since then. Uh, this is the uh, one of the founders, and he's discussing, um, and this is an interview. I'm going to try to link it in the description. This is a recent interview he did, and he's talking about how much uh, – materials and things have advanced and i think that's that's the key to this whole vehicle is battery technology has advanced to the point where this really works well the the motors these in wheel motors that that was key that works well with this design the material science all the all the things are coming together for this design to really it, it it's met its time i think it's it's a, a really um it's really going to be a quite a vehicle. So that we designed into the original um, is uh, largely the thinking that we're putting into this new vehicle. Uh, but you know, the, the team, uh, our team up in Canada and our two teams up in LA, um, have had a, a lot of time to uh, see the, the evolution of composites in the automotive and race industry. It, 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 the formula industry uh, in the aircraft industry have, have changed dramatically over the last decade. Uh, and we're including that thinking in, in what we're doing today. But what it allows us to do is have the highest group crush strength in the industry. Um, you know, the, the previous vehicle, we went through all the initial crash tests, and we built our own uh, roof crush jigs and had the independent testing done. Um, it had the highest roof crush strength of anything you could drive on the road, um, which is a, a big thing. You know, if, you're, uh, if you're in a passenger vehicle, um, you know, it, it is not as strong as an Xterra. People see it and they think that the f is small and possibly weak. Uh, that's just not the case. Um, we, uh, we've also built in a, a front impact strategy that's very unique uh, and can really only be executed with a composite-type vehicle. Um, you know, great redirection of energy strategies, uh, great crumple zones, um, you know, foam in the nose zone, um, you know, that, uh, and, and so 
material that we didn't have access to 10 years ago. Okay, so again, I think this is a great design and it's even better now and it's, I don't think anybody has to worry about their safety in this. I mean, as he said, it's safer than most cars and I, 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 you know, you can compare it to an F1 racer because now they're all carbon fiber. They're all fiber. You see what happens when they crash, how safe they are. I think that's the same thing. The reason we're covering so much in the body here is because that's, that's the most complex thing to, to manufacture. Uh, that's, you know, the body in white, they call it. That's the most complex thing to get right. And, you know, this is what Tesla's gone into the castings and everything with to make to simplify this. So we've gone over that. You see how they mold that body and glue it together and you see how strong it is. Um, let's go over some of the particulars here. Um, the software controlling uh, the drivetrain and the user interface, I believe, is all going to be done in-house and the interface and, and the whole thing. Some people say it's going to be a Tesla, I don't, a Tesla software. I don't think so, personally. It's a possibility. Um, a lot of the other parts are, are going to be engineered in-house, but sent out, uh, I believe, uh, to other parties to manufacture, and they're going to assemble uh, uh, this stuff in-house. Um, We'll go over that in a second. Now, there's been a lot of stuff on. They got a Tesla steering wheel. They got a Tesla charge board. They got a Tesla screen. Well, I don't. I don't know that Tesla is feeding them parts. I don't know that Tesla suppliers are. Are they universal suppliers? Can Can anybody buy Tesla or Tesla like parts? Because they're obviously not branded Tesla. Are uh, they you know knockoff Teslas or are they Tesla? I don't know. It would be great for Tesla. If they were, uh, I mean, it would be great for Aptera if they were Tesla. But you can see here I have Tesla because the, the big talk lately has been on um, on the uh, the steering wheel. They're saying it is a Tesla steering wheel. Well, it doesn't have a Tesla logo on it, but it does look like a Tesla steering wheel. But again, maybe that's just what they used in the prototype. All right, so let's just go over these. Uh, this is the body that we've been discussing at length. We saw that, I believe they're gonna do that all in-house and all the body and the paint and everything is gonna be done in-house. They're gonna do that from scratch. These are the hub motors. Those, I believe they're gonna buy those outright from Alafe and Alafe may engineer special models for them. Uh, the engines and the control units are gonna, be bought and then they're going to program the control units. Um, these are the two superstructures that hold what would be the drivetrain in a three wheel drive. I believe these tubular parts they're going to make. In the first iteration of this thing, they did make them. These suspension parts, uh, of course, the shocks, I think they'll buy aftermarket, of course, but, but these other castings and so forth, I believe they built the prototypes of these in-house, and I believe uh, artificial intelligence might have been involved in this design, and that's to handle the weight of these motors and um, handling and everything else, but it's a very highly engineered product. I think they're going to send those out to be manufactured to spec, okay? Um, but these uh, tubular frames, let me just if, see if I can enlarge this a little bit. These uh, these tubular frames here, this stuff, I believe they're going to do all that in-house. And then these castings, again, this is going to all be done in-house. This is all going to be done. These castings, that's, uh, I believe, is going to be sent out. And the, the wheel hub motors. I think the uh, and then if we go into uh, the car itself, of course the wire harness is, could be bought aftermarket and so on. Uh, again, the control units—they're saying could it be Tesla control? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's going to be their own. But as far as the batteries go, one of the co-founders started a company called Flux Power, and what this did was supply lithium batteries to. Um, these things that move pallets around in the in the grocery store, 
okay? For example, they used to use lead acid batteries, okay? The flux power brought lithium to those devices. So they're industrial lithium batteries. That's his company, okay? I, I believe he's out of it now, but he founded it. So I, I believe that may be the battery source they have. And they may have their own special secret sauce on the batteries and they manufacture, may manufacture them for them. This is in my opinion. So, and as far as the interior goes, and again, we talked about the other Tesla parts. Uh, the interiors on all the Fords and all the cars that are made, they're first tier uh, suppliers. They design all this stuff and they build it and they basically send an interior kit. Nobody builds their own seats. Uh, Tesla does. Uh, I don't know if uh, Audi brought that in house, but anyway, the point is when you see like a Ford F-150 and you say, oh, that interior is great. Well, Ford didn't make it. A first tier manufacturer supplier made it. They may have designed it. Ford may have approved the design or Ford may have given them specs, but I'm just saying that that is going to come in a kit and the glass and other things I'm sure are going to come from suppliers. So uh, the point I'm making here is a uh, pretty simple, pretty simple vehicle. Uh, I, I think it's completely doable and uh, nothing is easy. Uh, if Tesla is involved, well, that would really be great, but we can't count on that so far. Nobody's saying nothing. They asked Tesla and they asked up there and they're, no comment. So I don't know if it if it if they did use it. Uh, if Tesla was in with them, boy, that's a killer. So Aptera has about a hundred million dollars in pre-orders, and just on Reddit, it's just that's about three thousand orders on the on the average Aptera. So so they got three thousand cars to build in this first run. As I said, the Dodge Viper averaged about 1,500 units a year. And this is the Monroe system they're going to use at Aptera. So this is like the bottom end of our manufacturing capability. You know, the Viper was an ICE vehicle, 100, 100 times more parts to assemble. Just think about it. The cooling system, building the motor, the drivetrain. So, so it's a much simpler vehicle, okay? So up there is using a new new material science and a new design for the body. And again, that proof of concept and they have experience in the past manufacturing this. So I, I think they can do it. I think they have the capability to do it. I don't think that's a problem. The question is how many can they make a year or how, how hard is it gonna be to scale up on this? So I, I looked for an example, and it occurred to me that, the, again, one of the founders actually founded a boat company to build boats that pull wakeboards. And um, this type of uh, fiberglass-like construction in these molds, and this is very much like building a boat, um, which is probably why he went into the boat building business in the first place. But as an example, again, this is back of the napkin analysis. Uh, what's, what's the, what's, here's an example of manufacturing similar sized boats that would be to the Aptera body. And they use similar techniques, not exactly the same, but this one, uh, this one manu manufacturer in an average year, uh, I don't know, I think they had 500 employees, I'm not sure. I don't know, maybe not that many. Anyway, they did 3,000 boats a year. So our, our bottom end of the range is 1,500. I think the max they can do, let's say 3,000, at least the first year for sure. And then uh, we get into the different molding techniques. I don't know if they're using silicone bag molding. The other method uses a mold, which they were showing. They may use a hybrid system. Uh, but the point is, this is a not much difference. It, it's it's great for making multiple parts. Uh, the vacuum pressure holds everything in place, 
And if you use a single bag, uh, the the uh, silicon bag molding method, which they got a uh, less than one day is needed to convert a mold to a to a closed molding. So in other words, uh, let's say they can make one of these a day for each mold they have. So if they have a hundred molds, they can make a hundred of these things in one day because that's how quick they come together. Of course, they got to assemble them and uh, fit them together. But I'm just saying that that is doable. So 1,500 to 3,000 units, totally doable, can scale up there. We don't have a problem there. And that's the biggest part, the most, I would say, the most complex part of the vehicle. All right, now the question is, can Aptera meet you know, the demand. The last time they got started, they ran out of cash right at the starting line there. Um, so let's just go over this. They have pre-orders now stand at 3000 That may increase. There's a lot of interest. Prices from 29, 25.9 to 46, and they have options and customizations. Now, they did say they expected to deliver them in 2021. That might be pushed back. But let's say they're going to do it sometime in 20. Let's say it could be late 20. Let's say the first one comes out in December 2021. And the sales for all 3,000 of these vehicles, based on averages and stuff, would be 100 million. Now, again, the Dodge Viper production was 1,500 units a year. Same line for Aptera. Boat can do 3,000 uh, units a year. And again, with this molding, less than a day to complete each body. So up, uh, uh, upper, lower, no problem. This is our orders, this is our sales. I'm gonna say, since they're just starting out, I'm going with the bottom number, okay? And I think this is pretty, this is actually probably really aggressive, but we'll see, I did a further analysis on this. It, it, it's doable. Uh, 1,500 units in the first 12 months of operation, whenever their operation starts. This will give them 50 million in gross sales or earnings before taxes, blah, 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 whatever that is, and in interest. The question is, you know, how long will it take them to start up? You know, but anyway, I think they're going to do 1,500 units in the first 12 months. They're going to make 50 grand in gross sales. The low end margin, margin on uh, on the vehicle is 31 percent per vehicle that would give you uh profit on sales or gross profit on sales of 15.5 million the burn rate best i could tell for 12 months right now is 4.68 million the estimates to get the plant up and running is 4 million so if you subtract the uh, the sales and uh, from the cost, you get 6.8 million profit. So they should be profitable their first year. The question is, are they going to run out of cash? Do they have enough money to start up? This is what happened last time. Uh, their present cash is about four million. They're they're 4.68 million in this. Now I have updated these figures, but let's just for the sake of argument, go through this. They're 4.68 million short of the 8.68 million they need to start up based on the cash they have on hand right now. They have another we funder set for this February in 2021. The last one raised 3.3 million. That still leaves them uh, 1.38 million short for the startup to, to fund the, the startup. So if they raise the margin, if they go to the higher margin vehicles uh, to, 30, to the 35% level, uh, they're going to increase their sales to 17.5 million, increase of 2 million, uh, 1.3 short. So they're going to be, they're going to have a profit of 620,000 in the first 12 months. Now, but they're still going to be short for the startup costs. They can borrow the money to do the startup, uh, they can borrow against receivables if they have the confirmed orders. But uh, 
again, this is what happened last time, 1.38 short. But it's kind of doable, but again, they, they're going to have to raise more capital. Even with this 35%, they're going to be profitable, but they aren't going to be able to cover uh, their startup costs. Now, it's really hard to find up-to-date information on this. I've been scouring all over the place. I got more information. I redid this. Here we go. Now, close but doable. This is the new figures I have. Let's just go over the, through this now. This is the expense case. This is no marketing, no delivery costs. Let's keep that in mind. So there's going to be added costs. This is back of the napkin, back of the napkin stuff. Of 1,500 units, that's 150 a month, 37 a week. That's 7.5 cars made a day. And this is taking time off for holidays during the year. I think that's achievable. They can do 1,500 units. This, even if they're just starting out, it would seem to me that that's doable. We don't know what, you know, whatever the profit margin mix is going to be. They're going to make 50 millions on if they go at the 31% level. Let's take the more conservative level. You know, the OPEX burn rate is 4.68 million now. That's going to go up. So the CAPEX is 4 million to get started. All this run through the ringer is 6.8 million profit. They could double this easily to 3,000, you know, go to 14 cars a day. Uh, once they get it rolling, I don't think. And they're trying to sling, uh, get together a hyper-efficient EV tax credit status because right now this doesn't, it's a three-year-old vehicle. It doesn't qualify for the seven grand tax credit. And under the new administration, this very well could happen. And of course, you know, Tesla could be involved. That would push it over the moon. Now, this is the funding. It's changing. This is what I've come up with, the newest, the latest I can find. Present cash on hand is four million. Uh, the we funder uh, with the buy-ins was four point eight million. They got two point five million they raised internally, and this is from a a guy who manufactures custom high-end audio equipment. He's a big uh, EV fan, and I'm sure he's got an equity stake in the company. But this is an additional two point five million they raised. Okay. So they have 11.35 million cash on hand right now. The estimated startup cost is 8.68 million. The excess cash they have on hand is 2.6 million. So actually 2.7. So can they can they do it? Yeah, they can do it. I think they can do it. Close. I mean, again, there's other costs that aren't in, but you know, ballpark, back of the napkin stuff. We funder point two is planned for February of this year. We're going to raise another, let's say, conservatively three million. That's going to give them five point seven million. So they're going to have five point seven million over what they need to get over the hump. And they have an internal money band, and they also have this investor that may want to go in more. So what they said was they have they're fully funded. And you know what? I, you know, I think they can do it. They're not overfunded. <laughs> and there's going to be unknown expenses and they're going to have to hire staff and, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it seems to be completely doable. If, uh, and they got Monroe involved and he's a crackerjack. And they got, uh, all the ducks uh, are walking in the right direction. So that's my analysis. Can they do it? I think they can do it. I think the car is going to launch. I think they're going to deliver vehicles. And hopefully that profit fly will keep flying. Their next vehicle they have planned is a five-passenger car, which I think, you know, using these same construction techniques and the same self-charging, I think that's a total winner. Uh, that'll be an alternative to Tesla. And it'll be a new paradigm, uh, you know, a new way of looking at cars, you know, which I think is what everybody's expecting with an electric vehicle. Because, you know, you can take a Volkswagen Beetle and you can put an electric motor in it, it's an electric car. But is it? 
you know, people want the new, new thing. So anyway, that's the presentation. I think it's doable. And this is the camper. I didn't see these pictures. I think this is really cool. I really like the way this looks here. I mean, I was wondering how they were going to do this when I did my pre-order. I put this option in. It's very cool. Very cool. And I think these are these off-road wheel skirts, too, which are probably flexible skirts. Um, this is another option that, that comes. But anyway, I hadn't seen these. I don't know how many. I'm sure everybody else has seen them, but I thought I'd put them in here. And uh, there is a link in the description below. Uh, you can get 30% off if you want to order one of these things. I did. Uh, you get 30% off the, uh, it's 100 US dollars. I don't know, wherever you are. Use the link and it'll help out the channel and uh, it'll save you money. Uh, but anyway, I think it's doable. I think in, and let's just move on here. The creepy music has started. I think as an investment that, you know, Aptera is, you know, it's a speculative investment. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, they learned from their mistakes the last time. And uh, I think this is going to be a go. I think this thing is going to be on the road. And I think it's going to be very successful, personally. I mean, for me meeting a cer certain uh, need in the market. So that's it. I hope you guys liked the presentation. Best numbers I could come up with. And the creepy music's playing. Thanks for watching. This is MX2X. And that's it. Okay.